All right, so I know what you're thinking. This seems pretty hard to believe that Python could be sped up sort of magically by 10% just by one change. Uh, and some other things that I was thinking when I saw this initially was, is this just faster C Python? Nope, this is a completely separate project from uh, a research project actually from Nanjing University in China. Probably mispronounced that, sorry. Uh, another thing I thought was, is this just upgrading to 3.11? No, this is actually additional performance benefits that would be on top of those that are landing in Python 3.11. Is this a JIT like PyPy? No, this is not a just-in-time compiler. This is just a change to see Python, a pretty big change, but uh, you know, makes some good performance benefits. Also, it has mostly no downsides, which is also surprising. We'll get to the you know actual downsides and why they don't really matter towards the end of this. Uh, but anyway, let's jump into it and explain just what they did and how you know it might be cool that this actually lands in Python. It makes a pretty significant difference to a lot of workflows. Anyway, let's jump into it. Okay, so I know, I read an academic paper. This is really unlike me. I usually don't like reading academic papers, but this is actually a very good one. I will link it in the description so you can check it out as well. Hopefully the link doesn't die. I don't know, I found it on Twitter. Um, basically what the researchers did is they took Python, which is currently a stack-based virtual machine. I'll talk about that in a little bit. I've also done a video on it. I'll link that as well in the description. Uh, they took Python, which is a classically stack-based virtual machine and re-implemented it as a register-based virtual machine. And that led to that significant speed up, which is pretty surprising. Uh, but first let's talk about what a stack-based virtual machine is. And in order to do that, we are going to briefly summarize the other video that I did, uh, which is about the disassembler and how Python is compiled. Uh, we're gonna make a function which just adds x plus y plus z as an example. And we're gonna look at the disassembly of this function here. Uh, and I'm actually going to draw how this executes in paint just so we can see this very quickly. Uh, first, let's put our code over here so that we can see what we're talking about. All right, cool. So in a stack-based virtual machine, basically every function execution has a little stack different than the programming stack this is the uh, frame stack and this is where local temporaries are added or removed or moved around uh, and basically you pop or push or rotate values on the stack to do any sort of operation if we're looking at this code here uh, the first operation that it's going to do is it's going to a uh, load fast so you imagine we have an empty stack here i'm going to pretend like it's going downwards uh, kind of visualize a stack either direction the first load fast is going to take the value of x, put that onto the stack. Oops, x. Then we have another load fast, which is going to put the value of y onto the stack. Oh, why did we go away from here? Fine. We'll put y onto the stack. Uh, then we're going to do a binary add. Binary add pops two values, adds them together, and then puts them back on the stack. We actually get a new stack here. That is just that one x plus y value onto the stack. It's a little bit tedious to write this out, but alas. Then we do another load fast for z, so we get z onto the stack here. Uh, and then we do another binary add, and as before, it pops two values, adds them together, puts them back on the stack. So we get kind of a, another stack here. I mean, this is all the same stack, but I'm trying to draw it so that it's easy to follow what's, what's actually changing here. Uh, so now we have x plus y plus z put onto the stack and then finally return value return value pops a value and then exits the frame essentially so this is kind of how a stack based virtual machine works i've actually been super obsessed with these ever since i learned about this in 2015 at a pycon talk i'll try and find that link in the description i don't know if i'm gonna be able to find it um, but a lot of virtual machines a lot of programming languages that execute bytecode uh, work this way you know python is one example the JVM, Java's you know, classic implementation, is also implemented as a stack-based virtual machine. Uh, and this is mostly because the code size is small and it's really easy to write one of these and convenient to debug. You know, you're basically just dealing with a simple stack and the bytecode is easy to understand. Now, a register-based virtual machine is a little bit different. I've actually taken the paper's uh, open source implementation of Python and built that just so that we can look at it here. Uh, VM reg C Python. Um, they they list the um, the Git URL in the in the paper. Uh, but here is 
that Git URL if you want to clone it and build it and try this out for yourself because um, I've been playing around with a bunch of my projects and they all just work, which is great. Uh, but if we take regc Python uh, and run this same function that we have up here, def f x y z, return x plus y plus z, and we disassemble this same function here, you'll see that it looks pretty different. Instead of having a stack, we now have these special registers. In this case, dollar sign zero is the name of a register. Uh, when we do this binary add operation, it's going to access X and Y directly, putting them into a register. Uh, then it has to do another binary add to add that intermediate value plus Z and stick that into the register. And then finally, at the end, it's going to return the value. So we get a, a little bit simplified of a version here. Uh, and I'll show you kind of how that executes here. So instead of having a programming stack, let's actually open up another paint so we can kind of compare the two. Instead of having a programming stack, we instead have kind of a vector of um, registers. This is very similar to how your actual processor executes. So if you're, if you're familiar with assembly language, you'll have a, you know, a series of, of registers that are on your processor and they'll swap values in and out of there. That's an oversimplification, but <clears throat> you can imagine you know, something like that. Now, the way the registers work in this implementation of register C Python is there is a variable number of them and they are stored on the programming frame. In this case, our bytecode only deals with a single register. So you could imagine instead of having that stack that grows up and down, there's now just a single uh, block of memory here. And that is colloquially referred to as dollar sign zero. You could also have more registers. So if we, you know, if we had a, a program or if we had a function that needed more intermediate values, you would you know, continue to number them um, increasingly, and you'd get kind of this, this array of registers here. And so the way this, this executes is actually a lot simpler to reason about, or at least for me, it's a lot simpler to reason about. Uh, I guess I said earlier that stack-based machines are simpler to reason about, so I don't know. I think they're both pretty easy to reason about, but this one you know, involves a little bit more moving parts. Uh, but basically how this works is it's going to take values uh, and store them. So if we were to draw this out similar to how we did the stack-based one, uh, where we're talking about register zero here, the first step of this already has added those two together. So we've already put x plus y into here. Uh, then we have our second step, which is going to add the original value of zero and z and put it into there. So if we go here and we do the same again, we're going to have dollar zero plus z, and this is into dollar zero. I note that dollar zero here is the previous temporary value of x plus y. And then finally at the end, it's going to pop the value of, of the first register and return it directly. So I have a little bit simpler code flow, but the main point here and the main point of uh, register-based instruction sets in general is they tend to have fewer instructions to do things. You'll notice here we had three instructions to perform this operation, whereas for this one we had to do one, two, three, four, five, six. We had to do almost twice as many instructions to perform the output. Note, uh, now note, even though we're doing fewer instructions, the code size tends to be much larger because there are much more operands on each of the instructions. Uh, and so you tend to see fewer instructions, but much chunkier ones. And the overall size of the code tends to be bigger, uh, just from like the, the number of bytes on disk. Um, yes, and the, and the paper that did this confirmed this as well. Uh, they showed that the bytecode size on disk on average increased by about 4.4%. Uh, and that the memory footprint of compiling code increased by about 1.4%. So things were a little bit bigger, a little bit chunkier, but that was a trade-off to make things way faster. All right, so let's talk about why it's faster. And I'm summarizing the paper a lot here. The paper goes into a lot of details and goes over you know, a whole bunch of benchmarks. It also explains this same stack-based and register-based thing. Um, and there are a little bytecode thing there, how they compiled it. Uh, where's their benchmarks graphs? Yeah, so they have a bunch of benchmarks graphs. I'm gonna go over a handful of them that I thought were useful. Uh, and I pre-run these because they take a really long time to, to run. Uh, I ran five benchmarks because I thought those, those five might be useful to you. Uh, and if we do compare here, I basically use Pi Performance, which if you're not familiar with Pi Performance, it's kind of the standard performance benchmarking suite that CPython uses. Uh, it's different than the PyPy1. The PyPy1 has some different tweaks, mostly because uh, 
uh, just-in-time compilers have different needs than CPython does. Uh, but anyway, I ran PyPerformance before the, the video, and I've compiled their two outputs into here. And if we do PyPerformance compare, we can look at the comparison between these two, between reg CPython and uh, normal CPython. Now note here, I've compiled 3.10.1, which is the version that reg CPython was forked from, mostly so that I could have apples to apples. I compiled them with the same flags, so I turned on LTO and PGO. Uh, the paper actually doesn't turn on PGO, uh, but with PGO, their benefits are actually much higher, so I'm kind of surprised the paper didn't do that to claim a bigger number, but I don't know, it's academic, so they probably wanted... I think I, think I remember the reason they didn't. The reason they didn't is because PGO introduces some uh, non-determinism, which, sure, fine, fair, whatever. Um, but you'll notice here that we see some benchmarks that are significantly faster than the standard CPython, the stock CPython. And these benchmarks tend to focus on pure Python code, which makes sense given what we said about the difference between stack-based and register-based. If you're running fewer instructions, you tend to be faster. And that's kind of the conclusion that uh, the paper draws, is that if you run fewer instructions, could go faster. The reason for that is the bytecode machine of C Python, the C eval loop, and C eval.c if you're familiar with the C code of C Python, uh, implements the virtual machine. And any time that does a churn, it's somewhat expensive. So if you can reduce the number of cycles that that performs, the code tends to go faster. Uh, you'll notice that some of these benchmarks show that things are either slightly slower or not really slower at all. Kind of this 1.00 is exactly the baseline. Um, and there's some things that are ever so slightly slower. The paper also confirmed that these were the ones that were slower. Their numbers were a little bit different. Like they were showing like a 3% slower, whereas mine is not that much slower. Um, but these benchmarks tend to be things that don't involve a lot of pure Python code. You know, pickle dict is entirely a uh, C extension bit of code, and so you don't expect it to be sped up or slowed down based on this. Uh, you also notice that you know the Python startup isn't impacted significantly, although they did show that bytecode compilation is slightly faster, uh, but they didn't have uh, statistically significant value there, so potentially faster there as well. But basically what I want to say here is any pure Python code tends to get faster, which is pretty cool. Um, I also mentioned earlier that uh, the instructions are slightly larger, and this leads to a slightly higher memory footprint when compiling and a slightly larger bytecode size. Um, but yeah, it's faster. Uh, there's one other caveat besides the memory being slightly larger, which tends to not matter in the modern day. Like memory is pretty cheap, and a you know a one percent increase in memory size or a four percent increase in disk size doesn't make a significant difference. You know, this disks are cheap. <laughs> you know, I can I can buy a, a terabyte uh, USB disk for like I don't know, fifty bucks or something. Like it's it's disk disk is free essentially. Um, there was one other caveat with the difference between a stack-based system and a register-based system, and this is that temporary values stored in registers tend to have slightly different lifetimes than they do in a stack-based system, uh, mostly because you know as soon as you pop a value from the stack, it's no longer being referenced, but in a register-based system, you will still have, you know, those registers still exist until the frame exits. Uh, so there were slightly different memory lifetimes for objects. This often had observable effects in things that dealt with reference counts or weak refs. But this is kind of already the case in Python. You know, the, the lifetime of an object is not strictly dictated by its reference count. There's a garbage collector that deals with stuff. You know, PyPy has its own different way of dealing with object lifetimes. And so you can't really depend on the object lifetime. But sometimes it led to objects living for longer than expected and consuming a little bit more memory temporarily. The paper did have a way to address this, which was to introduce a clear temporary values uh, opcode that they ran between every statement to basically reduce it back to the same baseline of CPython. And they were still able to show speed up with that, even though it did a bunch of extra work to you know, restore the ref counting situation. Um, but overall, I think this paper is really solid. It's pretty approachable too. So even if you're not, you know, a, uh, <laughs> a, a an academic type person, I'm not an academic type person myself either. 
Uh, I think the paper is very approachable. It explains a lot of the same concepts that I have, uh, but in a lot more words <laughs> and perhaps a little bit more uh, academic -y. But uh, definitely check out the paper. The other thing that I wanted to say here is most of their speedups are due to running fewer instructions. And some of the faster C Python projects, uh, you know, improvements are also along the same line. Uh, one particular proposal that came out, uh, I, it's almost a year now. It feels, it feels recent to me, but it's been a long time uh, coming, is the idea of reducing instructions by combining uh, common ones. This is another way to reduce the number of times that that C eval loop happens. This, for instance, by, by Guido is proposing a load fast, load fast, which uh, takes a common paradigm of running these two opcodes uh, at the same time and instead having a double load fast, which loads two things at once. Um, Basically, this load fast also runs this one at the same time, only doing one C eval loop. The idea being, you know, reduce the number of times you loop the VM, code goes faster. Uh, but anyway, that's Reg C Python. I thought this was really cool. I hope you find it's really cool too. If you have additional questions, leave them below or reach out to me on the various platforms. But thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next one.